Secondly, he redefined the doctrine of election. No, I'm not talking about Bush versus Gore. I already voted, by the way. We have early voting in Denver. Maybe you do too, and so I did that last Tuesday. I won't tell you. Um, <laughs> that would be to change the topic. Instead of one ethnic group being the guaranteed ticket to being part of God's chosen people, Jesus taught that his followers of any ethnic group, certainly all of his first followers were Jews, but not all Jews became his followers. Only a small minority did. He also traveled occasionally outside of Israel, engaged in brief ministry to Gentile, non-Jewish people, and planted the seeds for a substantial Gentile mission following his death. Thirdly, he implicitly and explicitly redefined liberation or salvation. Rome was not the worst enemy. Satan was, the devil. Or to put it another way, it's not political freedom that is the most important issue. It's spiritual freedom. Although we do have to remember that the separation of church and state was an American notion invented a little over 200 years ago and nobody would have thought of politics and religion not being intimately intertwined in the ancient world. Fourthly, he redefined the Messiah and his role, focusing on passages of scripture, particularly out of the prophecies of Isaiah 52 and 53 that spoke about a suffering servant who would be despised and rejected and die and the sins of the world would be placed on him and by his sufferings, humanity would be healed. Text that most Jews thought was being fulfilled corporately by the people of Israel, that they were suffering for the sins of the world Jesus understood that as a messianic job description, if you like. And so instead of leading a group of soldiers in warfare against Rome, saw his death as central to his mission. And then finally and fifthly, redefined the notion of a new age, of a messianic age, of that coming time of a, a golden era of peace and prosperity as something that in fact would have to come in two stages. So that there were many Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in his lifetime, but that there were many left to be fulfilled, including the vision of universal peace and lion lying down with the lamb and a little child uh, leading the wild animals without being harmed. That reconstruction of Jesus, I would like to suggest, makes sense and it helps us to answer some of those bigger questions like, why was Jesus crucified? Now, Wright is a believer, but he writes, a lot of puns here, as a historian and does not intentionally presuppose his belief in his historical work. So one of the things that he very helpfully does is develop a historical methodology considerably more sophisticated than the previous quests have developed, where in the past the tendency has been to see Jesus just in his uniqueness over against Judaism. Wright develops what he calls the double similarity and dissimilarity criterion. What does that mouthful mean? Well, he points to a number of features of repeated, frequently attested information about Jesus, both inside the Gospels and elsewhere, that fulfills actually four separate criteria. This criterion really has four parts to it. First of all, it must make sense within first century Judaism. Nobody can be so totally different from their culture that, that they're not even intelligible within it. But secondly, for Jesus to have had the effect and in essence start an entirely new religious movement, he had to have differed in significant ways from conventional Judaism. Similarly, there will be lines of continuity between what he did and taught and the movement he founded, the early church 
and emerging Christianity, but there will also be differences, ways in which his followers were not able to keep his high standard, in which some of his harder teachings were misunderstood or toned down. And when one particular theme or teaching fits all four of those criteria, or that one four-part criterion simultaneously, it's quite likely we have genuine historical tradition that wouldn't have been made up by anybody else. Interestingly, a large number of the major themes of the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, pass through this grid and come out with flying colors. If all of that approximates what uh, someone simply wearing a historian's hat, not necessarily presupposing faith in God or in the Bible of Christians, if anything like that is close to being true, then we have an explanation for the polarization that occurred in Jesus' day. And the polarization that is still occurring in many parts of the world as there are a record number of Christians as we speak suffering as martyrs for the Christian faith. More in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries of Christian history alone. It's ironic that we can live in the United States and particularly in university campuses, but scarcely limited to them, where, where the attitude is, whatever works for you is fine, you do your thing, I'll do mine, all things are, are equal, all things are equally true, when people are dying for their faiths, and not just Christianity, in other parts of the world where people perhaps recognize better than we do that if certain religious claims are true, then other ones are dangerous and cannot be tolerated, and vice versa. The redefinitions that Wright describes of Judaism that Jesus brought would have transcended enough of the conventional boundaries of acceptable Jewish faith and in arousing mass interest and attention would have also caught the attention of the Roman authorities who were very concerned to keep the peace and very plausibly explain why Jesus, according to the Gospels, was condemned by a Jewish court for blasphemy and by a Roman tribunal for sedition or insurrection.